Good afternoon. My name is Tim Herman, and I am uh, very pleased to be able to introduce to you all Paul Barrett, who's written a book called Law of the Jungle, which is a fascinating uh, story about uh, litigation both in the United States and in Ecuador that result in the biggest uh, judgment, uh, environmental judgment of all time. So please welcome Paul Barrett. <laughs> Paul, I think uh, maybe the easiest thing to do here is start from the end and work back, not the yes. very end, but in uh, 2011, there was a judgment uh, rendered by an Ecuadorian court uh, relating to contamination of the rainforest uh, by uh, Texaco in the amount of uh, $19 billion. That's with a B billion. All right. Why don't you tell us uh, uh, a little bit about how uh, it came to be that the lawsuit uh, was filed to begin with, and then right. we'll try to get some detail. Sure. Uh, yes, this extraordinary uh, judgment, uh, which came down in a rainforest courtroom uh, in a region called the Oriente, to the east of the Andes Mountains in Ecuador, stemmed from activity in the 60s, 70s, and 80s by Texaco, Chevron inherited the case when it acquired Texaco in 2001. Ecuador had invited Texaco to come to the country to exploit the vast oil resources that exist in the rainforest. Texaco did so, signed contracts with successive Ecuadorian governments, and produced a tremendous amount of oil. This was a boon both to Texaco and to Ecuador in terms of its economy overall. It uh, provided a great deal of wealth to Ecuadorian society. Unfortunately, for Ecuador's poorest residents, it was not a boon. Uh, economic inequality actually worsened during this period. The poorest people, in relative terms, got poorer. And the poor people who lived near the oil operations in the rainforest had it worst of all because they suffered the tremendous environmental side effects of the industrialization of the Amazon. Texaco was. Uh, kicked out of the country in the early 1990s when Ecuador nationalized its oil industry. And in 1993, a lawsuit was started in New York by American lawyers representing the residents of the rainforest against Texaco. That lawsuit wended its way eventually all those years later out of the courts in New York, down to the courts in Ecuador, and resulted in that extraordinary $19 billion judgment. So that's how the story begins. The op was uh, Texaco's operations uh, in the rainforest. Uh, we were familiar with uh, uh, exploration and production operations in the United States where uh, they're holding pits and so forth that uh, must be lined and, yes. and that sort of thing. What, what was the allegation or what were the allegations uh, that Texaco, uh, about Texaco's wrongdoing? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I'd say they're more than allegations. I, I, I mean, having examined this case very closely for a number of years, I mean, I, my assessment is that Texaco conducted itself egregiously. There was terrible corporate misconduct in the 70s and 80s, uh, the sort of uh, conduct that would never be accepted in this country today. For example, you mentioned waste oil pits. These are the Olympic swimming pool-sized pits that are dug adjacent to drilling platforms and into which the toxic byproducts from the drilling process are put. Texaco uh, dug hundreds of these pits. It considered the proposition of perhaps lining them with concrete so that the toxins would not leach out. Memos were exchanged within the company. A price was put on the lining process of $4 million. And then they said, no, we don't, let's not bother to do that. Let's not spend the $4 million because no one's looking over our shoulder. Ecuador doesn't care as a country, so we won't do it. On top of that, another example of Texaco's misconduct was that the production water, the vast volumes of water that come up when you pull petroleum out of, from underground, you have to do something with that water. It's tainted with uh, exposure to petroleum. 
with uh, naturally occurring salts, arsenic, other things. You have to treat it or re-inject it into the now uh, empty reserve. What Texaco did instead was discharge billions of gallons of this so-called production water into the streams and rivers from which the local residents drew their drinking water, where they fished, where they bathed their children. So the, the beginning of this story is, is one of corporate misconduct, and I think it's more than allegations. I think it's, at this point, hardened into fact. Well, uh, jumping forward, has, has the judgment been paid? Has Chevron paid the judgment? Right. Well, the one word answer to that is no. So then the next question is, is why? Well, Chevron is now in a position to say, we're not going to pay this judgment in Ecuador, and you can't enforce it in Ecuador because we have no assets in Ecuador. This, as you know, as a litigator, is actually not an uncommon situation. Just winning a lawsuit and holding a paper judgment doesn't mean you get cash the next day. Often the defendant will continue to defy uh, the, the winning party and say, come and get my stuff. And if, there are no stu if there's no assets in the, in the jurisdiction, there's nothing for the winning plaintiff to do. But, tech, but Chevron has more than just defiance on its side. Because unfortunately, that story that I began to talk about in the 70s and 80s grew much more complicated over time. In the 1990s, when, she when Texaco, now Chevron, left the country, it actually struck a cleanup deal with the Ecuadorians. Under that deal, Texaco agreed to clean up one third of the pollution sites. The government of Ecuador, now operating through its national oil company, now known as Petro Ecuador, agreed to clean up two-thirds of the pollution sites. Why the division? That actually reflected the ownership division of the joint consortium. It's important to remember as an economic fact, these, this was Ecuador's oil primarily. This was happening in Ecuador. The Ecuadorian government actually had ownership and responsibility for what was going on and took that responsibility in this contract and in exchange for this contract, which Texaco executed and spent some money, $40 million, to clean up some of the sites, Ecuador granted Texaco a liability release. Ecuador said to Texaco, you have d done your responsibility. You may now leave our country. So Chevron is saying, there may be pollution, but it's not our responsibility anymore. Moreover, after Texaco left, the National Oil Company took over the same oil sites and sad to say, became every bit as bad a polluter as the American oil company had. So for years and years and years, the Ecuadorians were themselves laying over additional pollution. And now, having been sued in court, Chevron says, we can't sort out whose pollution is whose, and whatever's there is not our responsibility. Well, you mentioned that, uh, that people representing uh, these indigenous uh, uh, residents of, yes. the, of the uh, rainforest had filed suit in New York in, in federal court. Right. And uh, uh, the federal judge in, in New York was inclined to dismiss the case uh, based on uh, uh, grounds that we don't want to get too deep in the weeds about. Well, we, I, we can actually state it pretty quickly. Um, Texaco said this is the wrong place to have this fight. This fight, if it de deserves to... It, happen anywhere should happen in Ecuador. The Ecuadorian courts are perfectly fine, and the U.S. courts agreed, dismissed the case, and Texaco got what it wished for. And then it turned out they should be careful what they wished for. <laughs> All right, so why don't you give us uh, some of the main uh, players in this, uh, in this drama. Uh, the, the, obviously, the lead uh, figure in your book is... Uh, uh, the plaintiff's lawyer from uh, New York City, but right. uh, why don't you give us a little rundown on the cast of characters here? Sure. Well, the, uh, the, the, the main protagonist here, for better or for worse, is a, a very charismatic, energetic plaintiff's lawyer named Stephen Donziger. He started out as the most junior lawyer on the plaintiff's team originally back in 1993, and over time rose to have control of the case and to be the, the dominant lawyer in the case. Uh, he was a graduate of Harvard Law School, where he was a classmate um, of a gentleman named Barack Obama. He uh, had worked for several years before law school as a journalist in Nicaragua, covering the Nicaraguan uh, Civil War. 
Uh, he had a tremendous personal interest in Latin America, spoke Spanish. 